Welcome to Beyond the Frontline Podcast, where your hosts, U.S. Air Force veterans, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson, will help you transition from the front line to the home front. Listen every other Wednesday as they will bring great conversations, resources, tips, and feel good stories that will resonate and relate. Now, here's your hosts, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson. Hello, 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 everybody. This is Jay Johnson bringing you another edition of Beyond the Front Line. I'm sitting here with the one and only. I'm no longer going to refer to her as my partner in crime because we've given her the new name. The Say It. Come on. That's hard. I don't know if I want to do this. (laughs) We now affectionately refer to her as the (laughs) queen. The queen. She had a friend just in town visiting, as a matter of fact, and she brought you a coffee cup that said queen on it. It did say queen. It's and, and on the inside, it said every single day. Yeah, it we got to. Perfect. Yeah, I don't know what's happened. I've lost control, <laughs> and uh, and now I have to deal with this on a recurring basis. Donna, what's going on with you? I know we're recording this well in advance of when we they'll are. receive it, but today's a big day for you and your hubs. What's, what's happening it today? It is our 16th wedding anniversary. That's kind of cool. It uh-huh. is. But we celebrated last night. So we went out to dinner and and I, I'm just going to tell you that I have marriage advice for, for anybody that's looking to get married and you live down in the Southern part of the U S do not get married in May because, and you, and you're planning on having kids because school's getting ready to let out. There's all the after school functions. There's all the banquets, there's all the awards. There's everything that we're prepping up to get ready for the summer and then somewhere oh, in our daughter's birthday is like right at the end of April so that starts everything and then somewhere in there is our anniversary which we notoriously forget because he used to be deployed for almost all the time because he'd have to pick like do I want to be home for Thanksgiving time or Christmas and he would pick Christmas to try to be home for the kids right if he had a choice and um, notoriously he would end up uh, where we would end up not celebrating our our anniversary, yeah. and so now we're this year we're like, oh, we we can do something, and the kids it, are old enough. Yeah, and you're not with him; you're here with me, recording a podcast. I well, mean, he's Brian doing grad work. No, him, he's so. doing grad work right now. He's finishing <clears throat> his paper for his graduate certificate well, in history. Good. So yeah, no, he's our, my brainiac. So. And, but it's also brutally hot in May. I got married in May as well, and, and brutally, brutally hot, hot. but. But of course, I was just in Alaska and I spoke for two days out there and then we ran around and spent time in Anchorage and the yep. weather's was like the weather was like low fifties. It felt amazing. I was walking around in, in short sleeve shirts all the time. Then I come back to this humidity and yeah, it's pretty brutal right now. We yeah. try to do the T tops on the Jeep and Bianca pretty much melted yeah. into the Jeep. I was yeah, like, you gotta do it at like six in the morning. Right. And even then it's tolerable right. for about fifteen minutes. That's it. So yeah, we had that, had a big book event, launched our Yeah, that was book. good. I so went and watched you speak at yep, the event. That was came cool. up to that. So that was a good thing. And and just getting ready for more book events and going to the East Coast to see family and going on an RV trip and six, summer. Six weeks in an RV with two kids and 20 dogs and whatever. Two kids, two dogs. Oh, that's close. My brother and his wife and their four kids and their dog. Yeah. And we range from the age of 14 to three and a half. Or, yeah, so it's going to be like mass chaos. So I just want to put it out there to all of our podcast listeners. Future episodes, you know, beginning somewhere around late summer will probably be me and either Donna or me and her husband, Brian, because one of them's <laughs> probably not coming back from that RV trip. That's no, what I think so. By the time y'all hear this, we'll be in the middle of our RV yeah, trip. That's so. <laughs> true. When you listen to this one, that's true. I'll give you guys an update if I survived it or not. I, actually, if you get an update, then I did survive it, right? Yeah, really so. good. So we got a good episode today, right? We really did. excited about who we're sitting here with in this time and space. You want to kind of tee it up for everybody and introduce our guests we do so we're going to be talking about we should say our topic first right we're talking yeah. about nonprofits. yeah i think they need to know that yeah we're talking about nonprofits today. What, what's the applicability help them understand the well when you when you're transitioning out you're trying to figure out what you want to do right and so some people get motivated in different ways right and one of the ways that people can can um, express themselves or be creative is to start a nonprofit. So it. we thought it would be really wise to talk to somebody that's starting a nonprofit it's in the midst of this 
and has it running and what the good, bad, and ugly is of it. And we're going to talk about her nonprofit a little bit because it's cool. a pretty awesome nonprofit. Well, I'm so. excited. Let introduce her. All please. right. So Michelle Lang, she's our superstar guest host today. She has been a military spouse for the last six years. She has a degree in business and sports management and went on to work in the wellness field as a community health and wellness coordinator. She's helped assess the needs of the community and fill them by finding programs to implement. She left that job in 2015 to join her now husband in Fort Drum and began struggling to find meaningful work again. Shortly after her husband transitioned from the military in 2019, they were made aware of several gaps in finding local veteran resources to help her husband and family. So through that struggle, Michelle began to think about a bigger picture solution to this issue. The family moved down to Fort Bragg and her husband rejoined active duty. And that's where Veteran Health Point began in November, 2021. And we're gonna get into that um, when we're talking you know, throughout the podcast, what led her to this specifically. So today, Michelle advocates for military spouses and veterans by connecting them to local resources they need while building a database of local resources through Veteran Health Point. So with no further ado, welcome Michelle. Hey, thanks for having me. That's pretty cool. Pretty excited about this. I think nonprofit discussion has, is long overdue. So. so Michelle and I met through Instagram. Like it was a random, like anytime somebody follows me, I always send a thank you out like every time. So Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is. Right. And every once in a while, it leads to discussion, which that's what happened with us. Right, Michelle? That's what led to I this. think so. Starting to chit chat. I don't know. It's been a little while. So we yeah. Track. But um, Michelle, I want you to start by telling us your story. Like what led you to wanting to start a nonprofit? Sure. I'll um, try and talk as this baby keeps like migrating up. And so I swear like he must be big because he, he like collapses a lung. And so it seems like if I'm sitting down, I'm like <sighs> trying to catch my breath all the time. <laughs> Well, we, we, need to, body. we need to tell the audience that she's also a superwoman. So she's on baby number three, starting a nonprofit. And I have watched some of her videos and she can still outperform people in fitness that are not pregnant. So I'm just going to leave that there. <laughs> hey, you got to stay active. So that way, when, when time comes, you can just go get that baby out. And let's, let's, let's go. go right. There's no time. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so why I started this nonprofit is because um, when my husband left the army in 2019, it was a really, really quick transition for him. It was um, not something that he had planned to do. He had planned to be in the army for 20 years. He wanted to make a career out of it. So when he saw the writing on the wall, on the wall um, we just kind of had to go with it. And he probably had about, I think two or three months to get out Oof. and make those decisions for our family. Um, so we, I mean, he did everything that he needed to do on his end. He went to SFL tap. He um, even got his CDL license because he thought backup plan, I can always drive truck. Um, he has a degree in Eastern Asian studies. So he's like, this is not useful <laughs> in the real world. I need to figure something out. Um, so he, he ended up getting a job. He worked with a headhunter company and they placed him uh, at a company back home in Pennsylvania where we're both from. So we thought, oh, great. You know, this is the closest we've ever lived to family. We would be his sister-in-law lived in the same town that we are moving to. And then my family was two hours, two and a half hours away. So it was perfect. Um, you know, you don't ever want to be like too close to family, but you don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Just so it, was, it was great. But um, whenever we got there, he really started to decline. Um, and gosh, just lost all of his self of purpose, self-worth, because he wasn't wearing that uniform anymore. He didn't have anybody in the area to connect with. He was certainly not doing anything that he had ever envisioned in his life, but it was paying the bills. And he was miserable, absolutely miserable doing it. Um, and it, it just totally broke our marriage. It, it broke our relationship. It got 
so, so bad that, um, you know, he was denied, what started it off was he was denied care at the VA uh, in our area. So it's like, well, what are you supposed to do whenever the organization that's supposed to help you denies you? Um, like, where, where do you go? What are we supposed to reach out and do? Well, he reached out to some other people, but they weren't experienced with the military. So his care was not really meeting his needs because they couldn't relate to him and his experiences. And me as his spouse, I'm trying to get him the help that he needs. That's the, you know, stressful on me. I just found out I was pregnant with our second son. Um, And then, you know, our relationship just totally falls apart. I had to just basically pretend that I was a single mom. Um, He was just a roommate. He takes care of himself. I don't worry about him. I'm just worrying about my son and the, you know, my second son, that's all I can do. And I put myself into therapy um, to try and figure out, you know, how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And through that, we were able to um, come back together and figure out what we needed to do. I was lucky to find a really great therapist and he was able to reach out to some of his friends, um, that were veterans and they, you know, kept in touch with him, pointed him in the right direction, got him the resources he needed. So long story short, he was able to get back on his feet mentally, Mm -hmm. so to say. Um, but at the end of that, it was so, so frustrating because it was just like, why were we not, I, I'm not uneducated. I'm not, you know, a lazy person. I'm, I was Googling my butt off and, you know, researching and doing everything I thought I needed to do, but these resources weren't coming up for me. So it was very frustrating that everything was word of mouth. And at the same time, we're going through this, our neighbor, who was a Vietnam veteran, was getting evicted from his house. And his kids didn't live in the state. They didn't know what to do to help him. He, at that point, had nowhere to go. And his partner, they were not married. She had nowhere to go because they couldn't go together. The, you know, whenever you're not married in the eyes of the, of the military, it makes things a little hairy. Right. So we were able to get him placed in a local home and her place in a, in a local home until they could figure out a long-term solution. But if we hadn't known what to do or known who to contact because of what my husband went through, how are they going to figure out what resources to find? Because that was not listed on the internet. Like he, there was just a woman in Lancaster that ran a, she was a, um, a Vietnam veteran widow and she ran a mansion that hosted Vietnam vets um, basically free of charge. Wow. So that was not listed anywhere, but we knew that through the network that we were connected to now. And it just seems a lot of people are missing out on help that they need because these smaller nonprofits, these smaller businesses don't have the marketing capability or, um, you know, manpower to get the word out and make themselves more searchable and easily accessible to the clients they're trying to serve. Right. So when, when my husband finally deployed, I just was kind of like stewing, like there has to be a way to fix this. And I started talking to more and more people. And, um, even after I started this, I found out like my friends came to me that were military spouses and they're like, we had so much trouble finding what we needed to find. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me, why didn't you reach out? I would have tried to help you. Um, but everyone feels like they need to struggle alone and kind of want to be do it yourself first. And that's great, but gosh, asking for help, it's hard to not know what you don't know. So I'm trying to basically close that gap um, by bringing awareness to the situation and also connect clients to the nonprofits and the nonprofits to the clients. How explain, let's talk about your nonprofit, specifically what you're doing to fill that gap. And then we're going to talk about you starting 
then how you went about starting the nonprofit. So your nonprofit is Veteran Help Point, right? Mm -hmm. And you found the gap, you already explained this gap that you find. So what specifically is it doing? Like, I mean, I know what you're doing because we've talked, but how are you going about it? Because I mean, it is, it's pretty in intensive what you're doing. Yeah, it's interesting. Depending on who I talk to, they're like, oh yeah, you, you need to scale it down or, oh, this is a great idea. And I'm like, I, I know this is, I'm well aware it's a very, very large task, but it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, so we are curating a database of local resources um, and we're trying to make it as intuitive and user-friendly as possible so that way you can get the help that you need in your area. Right. There's already a lot of databases out there that are um, you know, national programs, state programs, but a lot of people need that human connection. They need somebody in their area. And there's a ton of nonprofits because like me, you know, people go through uh, problematic times or, you know, situations that were not ideal and it causes them to do something about it and start these nonprofits and, and reach out and help their local community. So we're trying to focus only on local resources to get people the help they need a little bit faster than maybe somebody that, um, would have to reach out to one of these national programs and call 1-800 number or be, you know, if, I recently. If, when yeah. you say local, it's local in every state. I mean, you're, you're going state by state and you're doing each state and pulling the resource. I mean, this is, this is a very labor intensive, what you're doing. I mean, it's impressive. Yeah. And we're, we're trying to, so right now we have 10 categories of help because um, I believe that, you know, for somebody to be well as, as a human being, you need to be well holistically. So, you know, if your finances aren't right, it's going to cause your marriage to have um, issues. Right. If your mental health isn't right, I mean, it's just like one thing leads to another. So, we are focusing on these 10 categories so that way, whatever you need help in to be well rounded out, you can get the help that, that you need. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, I'm going to be homeless tomorrow. It can be like, well, we have those resources, but we also have resources if you need to move to another town because right military moves a lot. So what if you're moving to another town and you just need to buy a house in, a, in another town, but you want somebody that's experienced with military and the VA loans, because that's a whole nother ball game. So right. we're gonna have, uh, you know, crisis resources and resources for uh, stability, long-term stability, things like that. So we're really, really trying to cover all the bases to make sure that you have all the tools that you need to be um, fulfilled in your life. So what I love, Michelle, just listening to you briefly is no veteran, no person, no human being wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'm going to be homeless. So when you start talking about this cascading effect, that's kind of that paraphrasing, but that's, that's what I hear. You know, one thing often does, if it's not taken care of, then lead to other things that manifest. So yeah, I don't think sure. anyone wakes up and says that. So it's not an overnight affair. So you mentioned 10 categories. I heard you say finances. What else? Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the other categories where you're helping? <clears throat> okay. So we have primary care, uh, holistic therapy, physical therapy, um, mental health, financial aid and literacy, benefits, fitness, legal aid, um, job assistance, and housing assistance. That's good. Yeah. That, that's very comprehensive. Those are very good. Yeah, that's what I want to start with. And then, um, you know, I want to be able to tailor a certain side of the, the website to spouses um, and specific resources for them, mm -hmm. um, specific resources for military children um, and specific resources for caregivers because they're, I mean, if you're going to be a family unit, you have to take care of the family unit. It definitely helps if you take care of the veteran, but you know, me as a military spouse, not being able to find meaningful work that caused 
my husband and I's relationship to have some friction because I resented him um, for me choosing this life. You know, I couldn't find a job. Right. And somehow that caused our relationship to suffer a little bit. It's totally my deal, but you know, we're human. We want to get out on somebody. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm really one step at a time. We're taking one giant step right now. Um, but I do want to build out in the future. So that way the entire family unit is taken care of. It's interesting. One thing you said, Michelle, just, it, I, we're not going to rabbit hole this. We're not going to go off on a sidetrack, but when you're talking about, you know, we need an outlet and sometimes that outlet is our spouse, a significant other, a close friend. I think we do that because we assume falsely, probably that no matter what we do, they're always going to love us. But the truth is that we all have stressors, right? And if we're not careful, those that are closest to us, we can end up pushing away unintentionally by using them continually as that outlet when we needed someone else, particularly maybe, not maybe, probably somebody who's trained in that specific domain. So I love uh, hearing what you're doing. Yeah, I, I said, I've, I've worked, how long have we been talking? We've been talking for a couple of months. I think we months. started talking in like January, maybe. Probably. Yeah, we've been talking for a little bit here and there. And so it was impressive. And then what kind of caught my attention was just, you know, everything that she's doing. And, you know, it's like some people are saying, oh, my God, that's too much. And I'm like, is it? I mean, if you take small bites, you know, is it really? And and so what I kind of want to turn this to, like, I want everybody to understand what you are doing. But now what I want to do is is go up a level and I want you to kind of talk to people like how you started the nonprofit, what you ran into, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what you're running into, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like kind of talk about nonprofits in general and how you went about it. Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. Easy, easy talking, easy. Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> it is, this is... Um, I think aged me 10 years coupled with my son that <laughs> is a daredevil. I, it's just rapidly um, aged me. That's why I dyed my hair pink. <laughs> uh, so what I got started with was just talking to people that had nonprofits, mm-hmm. um, what they were doing, what they did. And researching what I wanted to do. So, you know, I, I researched a little bit because when my husband and I were going through it, I couldn't find the help that we needed. Right. Um, so there I was like, well, that's my experience. I still couldn't find what I needed. But when I was looking to start the business, I did a little bit more research because um, it's always better I think to join an effort than try and compete with people however you might have competition out there and you need to weigh the pros and cons to whether you should start something that is going to directly compete or whether your services would be um, better used maybe joining them so there's nothing wrong with that um What's been interesting though, is that I've been finding these other databases along the way. They're doing something extremely similar to what I'm doing. Some maybe even the same that I've never found before. I'm like, well, I've already started this now. Like to the point where I was just like, oh, my, like, oh somebody else is doing it, but they're not, um, I don't wanna, I'm not like talking bad. Is it just not doing it the way I'd wanna do it? Right. And they're not doing it in a way that I've, I, I live that and it wouldn't be useful to me. So I'm trying very hard to keep the client in mind um, who's going to be using this. But step one was, you know, crawling before I wanted to run. Mm-hmm. And I started walking before I was crawling. And then I got a reality check um, from a mentor and I had to, you know, sit down, take breath and 
reanalyze everything. Um, what was the reality so check? Like, you're just not ready. Your, yeah. your systems aren't in place. You're just not ready. Like, you're trying to do too much and it's not going to happen. You're going to set yourself up for failure. Right. And, right. you know, whenever I think a lot of people start nonprofits, they want to start out running because you don't, you don't start a nonprofit to make money. Um, you started to help people. So I really had to um, lead with my head instead of my heart mm -hmm. and start putting on my business cap and get my systems in place first and make sure that, and we're still doing that, right? Because we're still right. trying to uh, fundraise and as you fundraise and you need to, you know, put more money into your business because whether people like it or not, a nonprofit is still, um, is still requires revenue. Like you right. still need money. Are, are and, you, Michelle, I'm sorry. Are you a 501c3, a c6? What are you? A 501c3. Okay. So what, um, what kind of is, has been an, not really an issue, but it's just a different way of thinking for, I think a lot of people is the word revenue in nonprofits shouldn't be a dirty word. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, what is it we had? Do you, I don't know if the army had this, but the air force had it when we did our, um, what was the big fundraiser? The, um, not it. God. We'll combined federal Com campaign. There we go. The CFC, the combined federal campaign. Mm -hmm. And you get this big book of every single nonprofit that's in it. And it will tell you how much of their money goes to overhead administrative, and administrative yeah. fees and like all this stuff. And so, you know, if you see something that says like 20%, you're like, what? You're looking for like the 1%. And do we even really know what that means? No, no, we don't. We just know that that percentage. I don't know what their calculation is. I don't know anything. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to say that. Yeah, you definitely have to think more. Um, <clears throat> Well, I mean, the average lifespan for a nonprofit is one year. Wow. So um, the average lifespan for a for-profit business is five years. Yep. So you really have to think like a for-profit business because why else are you, are you failing? Why else are these nonprofits failing at such a rapid rate? And it's because you have this ambition to change the world and do good and everything like that, but you still need to have your systems in place. You still need to make money to keep the lights on. You still need to, you know, not everybody's gonna wanna volunteer. Yeah. And one of my goals is to be able to hire military spouses whether that's in a part-time capacity or full-time capacity, I want to hire military spouses to give them meaningful and fulfilling work that I wish I had the opportunity for. That's going to require revenue right. Um, right. and profits. So figuring out your business plan, um, this is what I would say to somebody that wants to start a nonprofit, just from the little bit that I've learned, <laughs> is 100% scrape the money together to go get a lawyer. You want a lawyer to, to, to file all the paperwork for you. Do not try to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you need to make sure that you have a solid board, um, people that are willing to commit some type of measurable time to this. Um, know that you are going to be doing it alone because nobody wants to tag on <laughs> to something that's not successful yet. That's there's a lot of harsh realities whenever you start a business and there's no feelings hurt. That's just how it is. Right. Nobody's going to have as much skin in the game as you. Um, so realize that now and don't get your feelings hurt. I always tell everybody, I have three older sisters. It takes a lot to hurt my feelings. Okay. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. If you tell me, no, you're not going to make me cry. That's worse than three um, older brothers. That's tough. <laughs> It's really tough. I have four moms growing up, so tell me about it. <laughs> so, Michelle, when you went to start this, you you did so you hired an attorney. That's what I heard. And but you you already knew what was going to be needed at the state. Each state 
sets the guidelines for what's required, right, inside mm-hmm. of that state to, to establish both a for-profit or a non-profit business. So did you already know some of what's needed or you truly went out and found an attorney who specializes in this, I assume, and they helped you uh, or you knew, you know, some of what you needed to have in place even before you went to the attorney? I knew generally what I needed, but not like we filed in North Carolina. Um, So I relied on the lawyer to explain that to me. It was actually pretty tough finding a lawyer that um, specialized in nonprofits because there's not money in it. There's people want to do corporate law. They don't want to do nonprofit law. So um, it was really tough actually finding somebody in Fayetteville to to do that, but I did. And he was able to just answer all my questions. And if he couldn't, he would find it for me. Um, because you can go on to your state website, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to understand what they're saying. I mean, it's a, they, they make it complicated on purpose. So that way you can find tax loopholes, right? That's, that's the whole point. That's why you hire a lawyer. That's um, why they have legal speak. Yeah. Well, yeah. One of the, yeah. And one of the requirements, Michelle, you've already touched on it. I mean, I heard you say you have a board, a board of directors, right? That's one of the requirements for being a yeah. nonprofit is you have to have stewardship. Yeah. So you have a board of directors and what does that look like? Just without going into specifics, how many uh, do, do you have some serving on it that have a, spe- a specific skill set that do you, you have know, criteria is, is providing oversight? Yeah. yeah. I wanted people on my board that I knew and that I could trust um, and that were going to support me and let me make decisions and uh, tell me when they thought my decisions were misguided or, <laughs> um, you know, they had better insight than, than I might have in that issue. So I, uh, my husband's on my board because, you know, he's, he believes in this mission and my, my brother-in-law is on my board because I highly, I think he's the only not him and I are the only non-veteran or serving person on the board. Um, but he, he loves the mission and he is very, very, um, well, he had, a, he has a special business skill set. He's, he's, he's just very good. He's very business-minded and he's very good at what he does at his job. And I highly value his opinion. So I got him. I was glad he said yes. My husband's cousin is on the board. He is an Air Force veteran. Um, and he brings a more artistic thought process. He's, a, he's in the cyber security world, but he's also a science fiction writer. So he has a lot to offer. And then I have my other uh, friend who has a nonprofit that's on my board. And so, yeah, I, in the future, I want to grow my board, but starting with people that you know and you trust is a pretty big deal and that you're okay to disagree with. I think that piece right there, Michelle, it's kind of what I was hoping we could get out a little bit, because again, this is for people who maybe are transitioning and they have this idea of birthing you know, in their mind, if you will, and maybe they want to do a nonprofit so they don't understand these things. So Don and I serve on a board of directors together. And then Mm -hmm. I have been on, I'm I'm on another one independent of her. And then I've been on some others in the past. And I think what I just heard you say, it's, it's really important that they both support you because you're the CEO, if you will, of the nonprofit. Usually in the nonprofit world, we'll refer to you as an executive director, right? And, uh, and it's your job to run the day to day. But what you really do need them to do for you, and you've, I think you've called this out, and I'm just highlighting it again because I don't want anyone to miss it, is you really do need people to challenge on occasion your thoughts, uh, to no kidding, raise a hand and say, wait a minute, I hear what you're saying, but there's this other piece that I really think you ought to consider, right? It's the whole risk mitigation and the financial, uh, you know, stewardship, I like to say, um, they need to make sure that the decisions are sound with the money that people are donating to the nonprofits. So I love that you've called that out. And I just, I really think that's invaluable for people to understand, but that is a requirement in most States. I can speak. Texas has that 
you have to have a board in place before you officially get your designation as an approved 501c3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like every, every state is different. North Carolina, I think you only needed three people on your board, Mm -hmm. but yeah, you definitely have to, you have to get over some things. Like if you're a passive person and you want to do this because it's a good cause, you have to realize that um, you're going to ruffle some feathers. You might ruffle your board's feathers and they might ruffle yours. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, it's a business. And as long as you can put on your business hat at that board meeting and discuss things as you know, board of directors, business partners, and then leave the meeting and then you can still be family or friends, whatever capacity they are to you. Um, that's really important because it, especially like my husband and I, we, I get irritated with him. Sometimes he gets irritated with me um, because we are on this board together. And, you know, I might be bossing him around a little bit or, or whatever. You have to be okay with really, truly making decisions and being the CEO. Yeah, it's a collaborative effort, yes. but you are the day-to-day operational piece of this. There's no doubt. Right? But the irritation is yeah. where the, the ideas come from. You know what I mean? Like the oyster makes the pearl because of an irritation and mm-hmm. there, I know it's just an analogy. Tension. Yeah, there's a healthy tension. There's, yeah, so challenging the thought process explaining it and you know being able to hear each other and see where everybody's coming from that's what makes the best ideas so yeah I mean I get it Mm -hmm. yeah for sure so what else did you have you found what it what has been here we'll we'll make it more focused what has been the best part of starting the nonprofit and the worst part of starting Mm -hmm. the nonprofit I like the word challenging. Challenging. <laughs> I try to stay away from negatives, right? He's Worse. Politically bad. correct. Yeah. What's the crappiest? There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's to the point. <laughs> now I'm thinking of micros, dirty jobs, right? I'm thinking. Anyway. Some weeks it feels like that. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Honestly, the best part of this so far has been entering this space where you have networking I would say like I would not have been able to I could have I suppose just by networking whatever but having this nonprofit and being able to reach out to people and ask for advice or ask for help and just learning what other people have done and also receiving their help and kindness has been astonishing to me I totally did not know that there were just like such genuine, lovely people out there that are willing to give their advice and time to a stranger. Mm -hmm. It has been amazing. Um, And I think like, it's been really good for me just as a human connection to realize that we are a community, like humans are more alike than what we give ourselves credit for. And being able to talk to these people and share experiences or um, relate to people that seem way out of my league. You know what I mean? Like executives or successful marketing people and and they can relate to me and my story or I can relate to them is wild to me. Mm -hmm. And so that part of human connection has been very, very refreshing and very fulfilling for me. So I I thought Um, you were going to say most rewarding was meeting Donna and I. Oh my God. uh, (laughs) Oh, you're on the list. (laughs) Just a little lower. I was fishing. I was fishing. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just having fun, Michelle. So what's the most challenging? What has been, I loved what you said about the human spirit. I, your husband knows this, but Michelle, look, being a spouse, you're every bit of part of the service in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. So and he's right. You talk about human spirit to connect on that human level has been, it, it is awesome, right? We get to find so many neat people, but there's, you know, with every upside, there's sometimes the, the downside to it. Yeah. And coming across the people that maybe not are not supportive of this or um, me or whatever, it's that 
that doesn't bother me. That's that I don't care. Have you but, run into what's the worst you've run into with people being negative about like what are the is it just no or is it just people like be, he's back, he's alive? I didn't have to like him. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm glad. It's an old age. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh people I don't know I haven't got anything too nasty but you know most cases people just ignore me or um not respond it's it's so easy over the internet to just not respond or ignore because you can see you know people read your message on Instagram or wherever you're reaching out to them and they just don't reply back they don't they don't like what I'm doing or they don't you know, feel like everybody has so much time to give. And if they don't want to give their time to me, I'm not going to fault them for that. That is what it is. You're not for me then. That's how I think. Like next, there's somebody else out there that whatever. (laughs) Noble intent, Michelle. That's what comes to mind for me, right? It would be really easy easy for us to get our feelings hurt, uh, to get mad, to view them in poor light. It probably is that they're just overwhelmed themselves and maybe they had every intention to respond to you and they just didn't. And so instead of prejudging them, maybe we just do exactly what you said, which is move on to the next person right. and, and assume the person wasn't trying to, you know, disregard you or harm you, hurt you, put you at a disadvantage in some way. I think that helps me yeah. in most situations day to day. Just to keep moving. Yeah. Forward. Yeah. Because people have people have come out of the woodwork and like been connected in such these weird ways to help me that it's been very very um just wild it's really just been wild and so I'm like well if that person doesn't want to help me I'll reach out to somebody else there's millions of people in the world (laughs) well and Um, technology where you connect is insane I was just telling Jay before we started this I had somebody from on a it was on a forum and I answered, I asked her a question and it turned into conversation and, and long story short, she was asking me to kind of collaborate with her on a very big project. And I was like, I was telling Jay, I'm like, she doesn't know me from Adam. And she's like, you know, you seem really level-headed. Would you want to do this? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's super kind and humbling, but, uh, you know, I, I do not have that time to give the project. Um, but technology, right? You know, Alberta, Canada, and I'm down here in Texas and, and boom, just like that, we connect, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. And it, it's great for connecting and finding the resources that you need um, that way. Probably though, the most challenging, gosh, has just been, I mean, what I'm trying to build is a website and it's a database. I have no experience <laughs> in websites or databases. So I've been teaching myself that I've been reaching out to um, people in the tech world that have, one guy gave me a two hour lesson on websites the other day, like bless his heart. That was amazing. And he taught me so much, but it, it melts your mind. And there's definitely points where you just want to quit. I mean, you really, really do. Or, you know, somebody else is doing that. I might as well quit. I didn't get the answer that I wanted whatever somebody else is going to take it there's it's so easy to feel totally overwhelmed um because you're trying to run social media you're trying to market you're trying to learn google ads you're trying to learn how to build a website you're you're trying to um you know learn how to be a ceo learn how to be a cfo like whoa all all the same time like you're everything yeah well, say, wait, I, I have to, I have to stop you here. We have to put a call out on Michelle's behalf. So if there is any techie people, web designers, especially people that are retired, looking for something of value that want to donate time, you need to go find a veteran help point, go find Michelle and be willing to donate some time to help her make a rocking database. Cause her and I have looked at some different sites that have um, different resource databases and we've talked, right, Michelle, we've picked them kind of apart a little bit and what they don't have and why they're hard to navigate and whatnot. So she's putting together by looking at all these other sites, what they don't have. So she knows what they do need, but she just needs that brains to be able to code and do all those magical things that we know nothing about. So 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good. I'm glad you did that. And and Michelle, there was something you said a second ago, then as I listened to you, you know, which is it would be really easy to see that there's other people out there kind of doing what you're now trying to do. Earlier in this discussion, you mentioned, you know, but there are things you do bring, have a different vision on, and it's why you, you're still doing it. But look, I'm a coach. And when I'm working with other people, sometimes I hear them say similar things. Well, someone's already doing that. Imagine uh, a hotel viewing the world that way. Well, we can't create something called the Holiday Inn because there's already a Comfort Inn and a Hilton and, you know, a sh- anyways, it just, a Sheraton. Right. Yeah, and it just mm-hmm. keeps going. So, and I love to point out that abundance is really what makes us successful drive around in Fayetteville and look for where the hotels are and tell me if there's just one by itself. Sometimes that's the case, but more often than not, there's a Holiday Inn next to a Comfort Inn, next to a Sheraton, next to a, and they're all filled up uh, when it comes to nine o'clock at night, you know, and very rarely is there a restaurant sitting all by itself. Sometimes, but oftentimes there's a barbecue joint right next to a hamburger place, next to a, a Mexican food restaurant. And there's abundance. So there is a place in the what in the marketplace, there is space for you. And you do get to bring your version of that to life for everybody. So I love kind of those points you've brought out. Yeah. And that actually I was just thinking about in New Braunfels up the road from us, there's two coffee shops side by side. And guess what? Neither of them have gone out of business. They're both too fine. I may open a third. I mean, I'm telling you, yeah, you can't have enough coffee. I'm just saying. Coach's uh, coffee. Coach, oh, that's a great Oh, idea. see? Like, I'm, I'm liking it a lot. There you go. I'm telling you. So, yeah, I mean, it is abundance. There, there is, there's room for everybody. And I, I personally think what you're doing is amazing because I said her and I, like, I'll call out the National Resource Directory they called me up one time and asked me to use my book and use the resources out of it. And I laughed and I said, yes, I said, no problem. And they took all the resources out and didn't put my book in it as a resource. (laughs) I was like, gee, thanks. That's awesome. But they're, I find they're very hard to navigate and they have a plethora of resources in there. But when you go in, it it is not searchable. It's, it's confusing, Clunky. clunky. So, that's not really, that's in her favor, right? Because now you can say that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That's how we need to do it differently. Right? Well, and listening to her earlier, I started thinking, wouldn't it be amazing that five years from now, 10 years from now, as she has built this thing, she has someone affiliated with her nonprofit here in the San Antonio area and, you know, yeah. and, and all these major kind of hubs where we have veterans, I, I, we're everywhere, yes. but I mean, in some of these major hubs, well, because mm-hmm. the way Google Analytics work is they're going to look, it's going to look locally. Uh, it's not going to find her necessarily easily in Fayetteville, not right now, not in the beginning, but she's already putting the things in place that will one day allow that to happen. Yeah. And the networking, I mean, actually, I haven't set it up yet, Michelle, but her, me and another gentleman have a meeting this week. Good. like tomorrow at some time yeah. <laughs> I get it up but we have this meeting because again met the gentleman through Instagram he started talking to me and he is uh, basically has this company where he makes t-shirts sells the t-shirts um, and whatever profit he makes he is donating it to nonprofits. and boom I was like oh Michelle bink and I was like I know somebody you need to meet and I was telling him what she's doing he's like oh i really want to meet her and i was like deal and so now we have a meeting this week right yeah, very so, cool. yeah. i mean the more you're talking to people the more you're networking the more you're connecting right and yeah. and and i think you said something in the beginning michelle that kind of resonated with me once you got plugged in you and your husband got plugged in then all of a sudden those resources started coming towards you right and mm-hmm. it's funny because we we have all these national big resources. They are actually sometimes hard to obtain because everybody knows about them. Everybody's tapping mm-hmm. on them. And so they, they are not always capable of helping everybody. And what we're missing is all this next level of all these startups and newer and smaller nonprofits that don't have all the SEOs that are making them shine bright. 
And that's what you got plugged into, right? The, the second vein. And then all of a sudden you were like, well, that would have been nice to know to have all mm -hmm. these resources when we needed them. And now you're connected to that, that smaller vein, right? That under underground vein, so to speak, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And I would really like on the, on the backside of my business to be able to help other nonprofits, because I really think that people start nonprofits with the best of intentions, but they don't like look at the big picture always at, until it's too late, or maybe they don't shift their focus to the, the clientele they're trying to serve, whatever. But, you know, part of that is marketing. If you don't have your clients coming to you, then how are you supposed to serve them? Obviously. So on the backside, I would really like to be able to grow this and help those nonprofits because you put a lot of time and energy and tears and anger <laughs> and like crazy breakdowns into the first year of your nonprofit for it to not succeed. So I really want to be able to help people succeed and get the clients they need so that way they can serve the clients that are needed to be served. I think that's a really important piece I'm taking away just from listening to you. I keep hearing your heart show up as you talk about serving and helping and meeting the needs of others. I, we probably all know someone, I know several someones who decided to enter into the nonprofit arena uh, really to um, equip themselves, not equip other people, you know, whether that was financially or, or for nefarious reasons, because it was going to bridge to something else. And I think when we're talking about being successful, when you have a heart for others, it shows up in everything you do. And, and based on that, you're going to be successful. I think it was Zig Ziglar who's credited with saying, never chase money because you'll never catch it. Instead, chase helping people and money will find you. So the bottom line is I hear your heart, Michelle, and everything you've been sharing with us. And I think that that's going to ultimately lead to the success of everything you're doing because people are going to buy into it once they see your heart leading out in front. And I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's what kind of caught me was what, listening to her and, 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 uh, and we, they said, we chatted a couple of times already and, and, uh, and I've told her, I'm like, my time is like finite because of all, a lot of stuff going on, but a, she's always in the back of my head. So when this gentleman popped up, I was like, Ooh, let's connect. Let's, you know, and that's what it is. Small connection, small connection, small connection. And, and who knows what that leads to, right. As you grow, as he grows, you know, and, and they, we see all the good work. I mean, that's part of the reason I love doing the podcast and I love like interviewing people and stuff because I'll learn about the people and what they're doing. And I keep track of all these well, guys. And we talked about the human brain in a previous episode. Mm -hmm. So the, the reticular activating system, once that thing's been turned on, all of a sudden, all these things start emerging. They've always been there, but it's now because we've put ourselves in that time and space that we can really see yeah. them and they find us. So it's pretty cool the way yep. that works. Yeah, it is really yeah. neat. So what advice would you give to somebody that's interested in starting a nonprofit? What would be like three things that you would tell them before they get going? Make sure that you have, I mean, be willing to commit your own finances to this because it is going to be you, you know, for some people don't make profit for five years, 10 years, whatever. It's going to be you. So you have to be willing to do that and do what it t takes to fundraise if you cannot do that. B, this has been like the number one thing for me because change, despite being a military spouse, change is very difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a control freak. And my husband will like absolutely like say like, yes, she is. <laughs> so Face pointing at me right now. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I know. Be willing to adapt and pivot whenever you need to pivot because if you are so set in your ways and you are so unwilling to hear the people that you're trying to serve or the people that are trying to help you you're not going to succeed and if you don't succeed you're not going to help anybody right so being willing to adapt is I think the biggest biggest thing um and just humbling yourself like it is, it's very difficult to humble yourself uh, just as people, right? It's not 
it's not like, oh, I'm so cocky. I'm so bad. You have to humble yourself and be willing to accept advice, even if it's advice you don't want to hear from people that have already done it and are doing it. Yes. I don't think you can, you, you will always get conflicting advice. You can ask 10 people, 10, the same question. You're going to get 10 different answers, but you're not going to get too much good advice from people that are successful and are, are doing what you're trying to do. So those are my like three things is be willing to finance this yourself, come to terms with, you're going to be doing it yourself, adapt and just ask for advice. You can, you really can never ask for too much advice. That That's probably the biggest challenge our, our veteran community has is asking for help in general, right? Cause we're, we, we work as a team, so that's not wrong. Like we all come together as a team, but when we are personally, when the team's struggling, that's one thing. You're all helping each other out, right? But when you're personally struggling, you don't want to bring that forward because that could make the team struggle and you're not about making the team struggle. So you're going to kind of keep that to yourself, right? And so it is getting out there and, and it is humbling yourself saying like, I don't, I don't know. You know, I I got really good at like, I don't know. I'm really good at, I don't know. Now I'm in the middle of a startup and I'm like, I don't know. They're all, we're we're working contracts. I don't know. (laughs) I love to say to people when I'm working with them and they're like, but I don't think I can do it because I don't know how. And I'm like, well, let's suspend the need to know how, right? What's one thing that you can do? Or who can you turn to to begin to find the answer out, right? Because- I don't know how shouldn't become a obstacle that prevents you from pursuing your goal, dream, or aspiration. That's really what I think. And when you find the people that are bought in, this just happened to me the other day. And I just said, you know, I'm working contracts in in a project that I'm, I'm starting up and I have a whole team and we're working in small little teams to work the contracts. And I'm, I'm working with specific people because they're the experts in the contract. Right. And the other day there was four of us and three of them were all working. They, one of the girls put out a whole sentence in this contract. And then the other two were slowly refuting the contract. Like they were slowly refuting the sentence and explaining why, well, this doesn't make sense because of this. And because of that, not in a bad way, but in a very you know professional way. And I was sitting back because let me tell you, I wouldn't have known. I would have thought it was all good. And I just sat back. I wasn't saying a word and I'm watching the sentence get eaten up. And I was kind of laughing because my friend, it was her, her thought process. And I'm like, well, there goes that, but she understood why it didn't belong there. They explained it, but they were doing it right. This is my project that I started up and they were all bought on in and they are going to make this contract work and they're going to make it work to be ethical, to, to work well for all parties. And I was just sitting back watching this in awe. And I was like, wow. Everybody was bought in. Everybody was on the same page. Everybody wanted to do good and magic was happening. And even though it was so simple, just like a couple lines in the contract, it, I really was kind of taken in the moment, like, look at this. And they were all working together. God. Yeah. I, and, and I want to bring your voice in on this, Michelle. Donna and I can get in these little tennis matches, but just listening to her real quick as I turn back to you. It it makes me think of a speaker I heard recently. He's a big podcaster. His name is Ed Milet. Anyone listening, I encourage you to go out and listen to Ed as well. But he said, people don't need to believe what you say. People need to believe that you believe what you say. I mean, if your conviction is enough, if your passion is exuding from you on why this is important, people will come. You know, the old field of dreams. If you build it, they They will come. come. You're going to find the right people. So back to you, Michelle. I mean, what what are you kind of taking from the you know these pieces that we're discussing right now? Yeah, I mean, back to what Donna was saying, like being able to keep your hands off of something while somebody else is working and they know what they're doing yes. is is a big thing for people that are used to being in control all the time. It's really hard to do, but knowing when to let go and knowing when to like step on and put your foot on the gas a little bit more and say like, no, I actually need to take over right now. Or, you know, no, you're, you're doing a great job. I'm going to let you handle that is, is teamwork. And you really can't get anywhere 
by yourself. And to what you're saying, like feel dreams, build it, they will come. I, I believe that in the nonprofit world, I mean, there's, I think over 40,000 nonprofits just for veterans yeah. or military affiliated in the United States. So it's a really scrappy business, to be honest. Yeah. So building it, but building it with your user in mind and not yourself in mind is, I think, a big key that you don't want to miss out on because we can get so wrapped up in wanting to accomplish this one goal and totally missing the mark and not even being on target. You were talking about speed earlier and just now listening to you. Uh, I'm the quote guy out of the pairing here. And, yes. And uh, this is what weighed on my spirit. It's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go, uh, far, if you want to go yeah. far, go as a team. You've heard that before? I, yes, that's, that's exactly one of the things that I say. It's like yeah. it, and you know the old adage, uh, "slow is smooth, and smooth is fast." And I say that's that all the time. What we're trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah, I I strongly believe that we go further together um, because one person, I mean, one person can't even run a country. You know what I'm saying? Look, right. dictatorships do not do not work historically. <laughs> um, so you've really got to rely on each other. And if you're not good at asking for help, or if you're too big and proud to ask for advice, I get on mentor calls. Like Veterati is a really, really great resource. I just yes. cannot recommend enough. Mm -hmm. um, I've got on calls with people from there that are really high up in their industry. And I'm, they're like, what do you want to talk to me about? And I'm like, look, this is what I'm doing. And I do not know what I do not know. So anything you can just throw at me, I will drink from the fire hose right now and figure it out. And I just take notes and ask the most basic questions. Um, I always say like, there's no such thing as a dumb question, but there, there are not good questions. So I try to ask good questions, um, even if they're very, very basic, because I want to learn and do it right and again if I'm not doing it right I'm not going to succeed and if I'm not going to succeed I'm not going to help people right um right. so I and this is kind of I'm not going to pick on anybody but I see a lot of nonprofits that are not that go further because they toot their own horn and they don't toot the horn of the nonprofit it's me Michelle I'm great this is what I did this okay. is me look what we did this year and it drives me insane and it, it'll come to an end one day. But, you know, if you're in this business, you have to be in it because your heart's in it and you do have to be, a, you know, business minded and you might have to be a little scrappy sometimes or yeah. dig in deeper. Tenacious is probably a very good word. You, you have to be really tenacious and be willing to hold your ground sometimes. But if you're not, if your heart's not in it and if you're in it to, say I created this and not be humble about the people that you're serving right. then eventually people are going to see that and you're not you're not setting anybody up for success no so, really good Michelle I think you know we're getting close to that point where we want to start to bring this this home yeah so uh, what hasn't been discussed is there something that we still well, want we to probably bring could, to light? We could like talk volumes on what should and shouldn't be done and whatnot. But I think we gave the audience a really good, lots of big chunks to think about. You know, there's a, there, there's a lot of um, people and I'm one of them, you know, I want to get out there and I want to, I'm going to go change the world. I want to do something great, you know, and I've had many different ideas. I've even attempted many different ideas and one after the other, they've fallen off for you know, a variety or, of reasons. Or gained better clarity on, quite yeah, frankly, or, as, as an outsider watching you, right? Yeah. Some fall away, but others you've dialed in on. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about like way even before I knew you. I mean, oh. there was other things I started, but yeah, you know. It, you've it, gotten it, better clarity since knowing me. Is that what that, I'm hearing? Oh, my <laughs> Lord. Yes, Jay. I just, that because the queen, the queen needs to understand that she's got people around her. That's important. I need right. a joker with me. <laughs> Jester. Jester. Uh, yeah. Jester. <laughs> so I mean I think it's important that people understand is like you you can have a good heart 
and good passion, but make sure you have the right people around you and right team around you to, to start this, right? So if you said it, Michelle, if you're a, a passive person, don't like confrontation, um, you, you're not really comfortable with talking to people, well, two things need to happen. You need to practice getting more comfortable, right? That's just the way that is. And you need to build a team around you of people of a different personality, right? Of a stronger personality of, like you said, you have this guy that's more business minded, this person's more techie minded, et cetera, et cetera. All of them brought together is what's going to make everything go well. You work well with them, you hear all of them, and then you as the executive director or CEO, you know, kind of make that final say. Um, so people really have to learn about themselves. They really need to know what they're doing. Go with your heart, but your brain's going to follow because you do need a business sense. It is a business. And in order to be successful and help people, you've got to run it like a business. So mm -hmm. that, I think that's super important. Michelle, any, uh, any final thoughts from you, things that didn't emerge that you want to make sure get out there? Well, as I'm, I'm thinking right now is another aspect that I've kind of had to wrestle with myself is a lot of nonprofits are started by women um, and just society, like in society, women have grown up to, you know, cater to, you know, speak a certain way or do whatever. So you really have to learn as a woman. I have never had any problem taking up any space. I, I'm the youngest. So that's all I wanted to do is take up space. <laughs> but whenever you're in the business world, it, it can be very intimidating whenever I'm talking to, you know, special forces guys or, you know, things, people that are very, very successful that are usually men. And I feel very intimidated by that. But what I've had to learn as a woman is to be confident in what I'm saying, be confident in my mission, um, and to just feel okay with taking up the space that that belongs to me. Yeah, yeah, I love that a lot. So I love to hear you say you're comfortable with taking up space. Stand tall. That's what I love to say. Stand tall in any room. You're the moral authority of your life, what you've done, what you're doing be true to you. I was thinking about angel investors. I want everybody to at least be familiar with them. Uh, there, are, It used to be angel investors primarily catered to for-profit right. organizations, but the truth is there's been a shift. So it might be possible to find an angel investor who could come alongside you, anyone listening, to help you as long as you've clearly delineated. You know, Michelle, earlier you said business plan. As long as you've clearly laid out the vision, and what that looks like. Maybe you want to pursue an angel investor to help you. And then last, I'll leave you with a quote as I turn to you, Donna, which I think is by John Bunyan, not the one with the big blue ox, just to be clear. But I think it was John Bunyan who said that you've not lived until you've helped someone who can never repay you. And that's me paraphrasing, but I think that's what a nonprofit does, right? You, Michelle, your heart has shown through. And I just really want to thank you for taking the time to be with us in this space. So I appreciate you. That would be Paul Bunyan. That's who you were thinking. Oh, Paul. Bunyan. So John Bunyan is the right quote. <laughs> Paul Bunyan had the blue ox. Well, look, I was educated in Oklahoma. They were cousins. So right. Just in case you were winning. Yeah. Okay. Don't be mad at me. Any vets from Oklahoma. I'm just having fun. Self-deprecating. All right. Well, Michelle, again, like Jay said, thank you very much for taking space with us and for everybody in our whole audience. Thank you so much for listening. We really do like to engage. We are encouraging you guys to reach out to us, talk to us. Um, we love to hear what you have to say. And so from all of us here at uh, Beyond the Front Line and our parent podcast, which is Coming Home Well, just thank you for being with us. And you guys all have an awesome day and a great week. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Front Line, a podcast of Coming Home Well. Join us every other Wednesday. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Follow us on Instagram at cominghomewell underscore BTS or on Twitter at cominghomewell. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well.